Hello, everybody, and welcome back to BioSC 140 Human Physiology. This is the part one video for communication and homeostasis, S2P1. This is on lecture exam two. So I've mentioned this a few times already in this class. Uh, I've asked this question a few times already in this class. How many cells are in your body? How many cells are in your patient's body? A lot. There's a lot of cells in every person's body. 75 trillion. Now, I mean, people of different sizes are gonna have different numbers of cells, but that's a lot of cells. You can kind of think of cells as people on a team, as teammates. Cells are teammates trying to maintain this thing called homeostasis. They're trying to help each other out, help each other survive in this world. And when you have a team, you need to coordinate the function of your team. If you've ever seen five-year-olds play soccer, there is no coordination on their team. There, everyone chases the ball, there's no communication, there's no coordination, there's no passing, there's no working together, and they are bad at soccer. If you watch a professional soccer team, or even high school, middle school, college, there's communication, there's teamwork, and there's higher quality soccer. Your team needs to communicate so it can work together as an effective team. There are many methods that your cells utilize in order to communicate and coordinate function, coordinate their activities. There's three main categories that they all are gonna fall into. Number one, direct cytoplasmic transfer. In direct cytoplasmic transfer, there is a protein tube connecting the cytoplasm of two cells, a direct connection. This is like the Caldecott tunnel connecting, what is it, Lafayette and Oakland. This is a, a tunnel, a direct passage that things can move between. One example is a gap junction or a connexon. We'll see these in a number of places. Two main places we'll see this in this class. We'll see this in heart cells. It helps coordinate the function of heart cells. And we'll also see this in the next lecture when we talk about uh, neurons in our central nervous system. Some of them communicate via gap junctions, this direct connection. Local communication. So local communication are gonna be cells talking to cells in their general area. These are gonna be chemicals diffusing to neighboring cells. These are gonna be neurotransmitters. Uh, diffusing from the end of an axon onto the next cell next to it across the synapse. These are going to be graded potentials. Graded potentials we'll, um, we'll talk about uh, in the next lecture, actually. It's local. It's in that area. It's local. It's in that tissue. It's in that, that cell's neighborhood. Long distance signaling is the third category. Long distance signaling is gonna fall into two main categories. Chemical, which is basically her hormones, and then electrical, which is your nervous system. So right here are gap junctions. They are protein channels that physically connect neighboring cells. Gap junctions are connexons. Small molecules, including ions, can move through them. They are selective. Different ones will allow different molecules to move through. And they can have gates, which can regulate if they are open or closed. We'll see these in two places again in this, like, or in this class, in heart cells and in our central nervous system in a specific situation. Local communication involves the diffusion of chemicals. So cell one right here releases a chemical and then it's gonna go bind to a receptor either on itself or on a different cell. 
chemicals released. It diffuses the fusion into the local area, binding onto a receptor on itself or neighboring cell. Autocrines are ones that act on themselves. So a cell is released into the interstitial area, binds on the cell, sends itself a signal. Paracrine act on neighboring cells. Act on neighboring cells. Diffuse into the local area, the same neighborhood. Local communication also happens with neurotransmitters. We're gonna learn a lot more about this in our next lecture about neurons and the nervous system as a whole. That electrical signal is gonna go down that long axon of the neuron, and it's going to cause neurotransmitters to be released by the end of the axon. These neurotransmitters are going to go send a signal to the cell they're right next to, the other side of the synapse. The synapse is the space in between the end of an axon and its target cell. So neurotransmitter released from a neuron into a synapse sends the message across. Right here we have a cell body with an axon. Right here we have the axon coming down and forming a synapse with that cell body. The neurotransmitter are going to be the chemical signals in between there. Graded potentials are localized electrical events that decay with time and distance. So graded potentials we're going to learn a lot more about. We're going to do a much deeper dive into in our nervous system lecture. To give you an idea though, We've already talked about how the sodium potassium pump maintains a charge across the membrane of nerve cells. There is, an, there is disequilibrium across the membrane of a nerve cell where there are more negative charges inside the cell, more positive charges outside the cell. A graded potential is when a channel protein opens up and allows ions to either flow into the cell or out of the cell. You can imagine a bunch of positive charges flowing in right here and causing this local area to change its charge. That's a graded potential. Positive charges flowing in through this gate, uh, this channel protein, causing this local area to become more positive. It can happen the other way where positive charges flow out. We'll get more into that with the, with the next lecture. So graded potential. It's a localized electrical event. It happens in this local area of this neuron. The further away from the opening, the less of an effect it has. The longer the gate is closed, the more that those charges are going to dissipate. Decays with time and space. The endocrine and nervous system carry out most long distance communication. So there are times when you need to coordinate with cells that are far away, not just in your local area. And these are your two methods of doing it. The endocrine system has to do with the chemical signaling. These are gonna be hormones and neurohormones. The nervous system uses electrical or action potentials. We talked a little bit about action potentials. We'll get more into it next lecture, but there's nerves are famous for this. You know, they're famous for sending that electrical signal down the axon. Long distance electrical communication, the nervous system. With the endocrine system, we have hormones. Hormones are chemicals that are produced in one part of your body that are released into your circulatory system and bind onto receptors of different distant cells and send signals. They're cells that are produced in one part of your body. Sorry, they're molecules, not cells. They're molecules that are produced in one part of your body, released into the bloodstream, and send a signal to a distant cell. Neurohormones are the exact same thing, just they originate from your nervous system. Neuro, nerves, hormones, you can kind of break the word down. So neurohormone. 
molecule is produced by a neuron, released into the bloodstream, flows through your bloodstream, has a sig sends a signal to a distant cell. All of these methods are happening all over your body. All of these methods are work together to form the communication system between those trillions of cells within your body. Each type of signal may cause another type and may all be present in a, significant, in a specific area. So the heart exhibits all three types of communication, direct cytoplasmic transfer, local chemicals, long distance communication. So the SA node generates local potentials. So you have something called nodal tissue in your heart. Your heart doesn't need to receive signals to start a heartbeat. It's got this nodal tissue, which just naturally depolars, depolarizes and just naturally reaches a muscle action potential and starts the chain of event for a heartbeat to happen. Those muscle potential, action potentials that happen in the SA node travel to its neighboring cells via direct cytoplasmic transfer. So local potentials cause cardiac action potentials. Those cardiac action potentials pass between cells via gap junction, so that's direct cytoplasmic transfer of that action potential from one heart cell to the next. The heart responds to autocrines and paracrines, such as histamine, local communication. The heart makes and responds to hormones. There's also, as we've talked about, neural communication with your autonomic nervous system. Intercellular signals must cross the cell membrane. So we have two main classes of hormones. Some hormones are lipophilic, meaning lipid loving. Some hormones are lipophobic or lipid fearing. Lipophilic, lipophilic hormones are gonna move across the cell membrane and they're gonna to bind to cytosolic and nuclear receptors. They're gonna find receptors in the cytosol or in the nucleus itself. They generally alter protein activity and gene expression. They'll alter what proteins are being made and how fast those proteins are being made. Lipophilic signals uh, hormones tend to end in own or gin, like estrogen or testosterone. They're steroids or steroid like hormones. Lipophobic signals, lipid fearing signals, tend to be proteins or protein like. They tend to be, or they are, polar or hydrophilic. They signal cells by binding onto a membrane receptor. So lipophobic hormones are gonna float around and come into contact with receptors, which transduces that signal into the cell. These tend to have a faster response time, like they make change happen faster. Now the endocrine system, the, the hormones communication system, this long distance chemical communication system that you have in your body, regulates a lot of things. It's really important to know about the endocrine system because you will have patients that have issues with their endocrine system. And it's important to know what can be affected by your endocrine system. Your endocrine system is considered an extrinsic regulator. Remember, extrinsic control means it comes from outside that area. It can have effect on your immune system, on the digestion and hunger, on blood volume and composition, on smooth and cardiac muscle regulation, it can have effect on reproduction, on emotions, temperature, hunger, thirst, metabolism, 
growth and development, it can have all sorts of issues. Who here knows somebody that has diabetes? My brother has diabetes. My brother is unable to make a certain hormone, insulin. That's how common endocrine issues are. Diabetes is one. Hypothyroidism. Like these issues are, you're going to have patients in front of you that have issues with their endocrine system. Here's some definitions. Uh, hormone, chemical released by a gland or cell into the bloodstream that affects a distant target cell. Neurohormone, pretty much the same thing, but made by a neuron. Chemical released by a neuron into the bloodstream that affects a distant target cell. Local hormones are chemicals that affect nearby cells via diffusion. Candidate hormones are chemicals not universally recognized as hormones, but have at least some of the attributes. Hormone effects. Some hormones have an antagonistic effect, meaning the action of one opposes another. Insulin and glucagon. Insulin lowers blood sugar levels, glucagon increases. Right here on this example, secretion of hormone A decreases levels of ion salt water glucose. Secretion of B increases levels of ion salt water glucose. They work in both directions. There's antagonistic control. We also saw this earlier on in the semester with calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. Permissive, permissiveness requires previous or simultaneous action by another hormone. So sometimes, let's look at this example. I think that's the best way to explain this issue. So right here, we have thyroid hormone interacting with this cell. No fatty acids are released. Right here, we have the cell interacting with epinephrine. A small amount of fatty acids are released. In this third situation, we have epinephrine and thyroid hormone interacting with this cell. A large amount of fatty acids are released. In order for thyroid hormone to have an effect, it needs to have epinephrine there also. And when you have both of them, you get a huge effect instead of just this little tiny effect of just epinephrine. Permissiveness, synergistic effect. So the combination of two or more hormones is greater than the sum of the individual hormones. So hormone A has the same effect as hormone B. When they come together, in this example, this is summation. Summation, they're added together, they're summed together. A plus B equals A plus B. They're summed together. The effect of them together is the same as them individually, summation. Sometimes they have synergistic effects. So right here, it looks like hormone A causes a 25 unit increase. Hormone B causes like a two unit increase. If you have A and B together, you get a 50 unit increase. If you add A's effect and B's effect together, you don't get A plus B, you get a giant amount, you get a more. The combination of two hormones is greater than the sum of the individual hormones. Synergism. When they're equal, like A plus B equals AB, summation. Here is a, uh, a table that kind of shows uh, some stuff about common hormones. So protein, protein-like hormones, they're water-soluble, they're polar, they don't need a carrier, and extracellular receptor. Steroids, steroid-like hormones, they're lipid-soluble, they're nonpolar, and because they're lipid-soluble, because they're nonpolar, they don't interact well with our aqueous blood environment. Because they're lipid-soluble, because they're nonpolar, they don't play well with our blood. So they need a little extra help moving around our bloodstream. 
And so they have a protein carrier that helps them dissolve in our aqueous blood and move around our bloodstream. Receptor location, intracellular. So right here, extracellular, hormone binds onto the receptor. Intracellular, we have it in the cytosol or in the nucleus. When we have an extracellular receptor and the hormone binds to it, we need to get that, that signal into the cell. We need to transduce that signal into the cell. And there's a process that this follows. So we have our signal molecule binds to a receptor protein. This receptor protein is gonna transduce the signal through the cell, it's going to activate intracellular molecules. Those intracellular molecules or secondary messengers are then gonna to go to target proteins which create a response. The first messenger is the extracellular signal molecule, the hormone. The secondary messenger is the molecule that gets released inside the cell membrane. Activated intracellular molecules down here. Common ones are calcium, cyclic AMP, C-AMP is cyclic AMP, lipid drive, IP3, gases, nitrous oxide, NO. So extracellular receptor, it binds, it causes secondary, secondary messengers to be created, which go and interact with proteins, which creates a response. Common types. Amplification. So we have our signal molecule, which binds the receptor, which creates, which induces the signal into the cell and releases secondary messengers. When it releases secondary messengers, it amplifies the signal. It doesn't just release one secondary messenger, it creates a ton of them, hundreds, thousands of secondary messengers. So that this signal goes to where it needs to go quickly. Amplifier enzymes activate numerous secondary messengers for each signaling molecule. So for each signaling molecule, there's many, many, many secondary messengers that get released into the cell, which speeds up response time. Receptor ligand interactions modulate signal response. So signal receptors exhibit specificity, competition, and saturation. Now, we've already seen these ideas before in this semester. So specificity is selectivity. Interacts with particular ligands. So look at this example. We have yellow square and we have yellow guitar pick. Yellow square and yellow guitar pick look similar enough on this one side of the molecule that they both can bind to this androgenic receptor and cause a response. Epinephrine and norepinephrine, adrenaline and noradrenaline look similar enough that they can both bind to androgenic receptors and generate a response. An agonist mimics a ligand. Many of you want to be nurses in this class. You should definitely know this term when you go into pharmacology class first semester of nursing school. Agonist, it mimics a ligand and activates the pathway. Many medications aren't the molecule that our body produces exactly, but it's close enough that it's an agonist and can affect that pathway also. So an agonist, it mimics a ligand, it activates the pathway. Competition. Similar ligands compete for the binding site. Antagonists interact with the binding site, but they do not activate the pathway. If this upside down crown, upside down Burger King crown, interacts, it's similar enough, this part of the molecule is similar, similar enough they can interact with the receptor, but not similar enough for it to cause a response. While it's interacting with the receptor, no 
yellow guitar picks and no yellow squares can interact with that receptor. It's competing for that receptor. It's an antagonist. It blocks the ligand from binding and it inhibits the pathway. Receptor ligand interaction modulates signal response. Saturation. You only have a certain number of receptors. If all of those receptors are interacting with a ligand, you cannot increase the signal sent. If every receptor is interacting with a ligand, you cannot increase the signal sent. There's saturation. The average cell, 500 to 100,000 receptors on a cell. Down regulation. So receptors on cells are not permanent. Receptors on cells can get old and worn out and they need to be replaced at a certain frequency. Your body can change how fast it replaces those receptors. Your body can cause there to be more receptors on the cell or less, fewer receptors on the cell membrane. Downregulation is when you decrease the number of receptors on a cell. This is going to decrease its sensitivity or decrease the amount of signal being sends, sent into that cell. It's less likely that a, a signal molecule, a ligand, will bind to a receptor and transduce that message in if there simply are fewer receptors on there to be bound to. Downregulation, it desensitizes a pathway, desensitizes a pathway. Upregulation, upregulation. So upregulation is when you increase the number of receptors or the sensitivity. Increase the number of receptors or sensitivity to a ligand. So you increase the number of receptors, you increase the likelihood that that signal will bind to a receptor and transduce the message. It sensitizes the pathway. This usually happens in response to a diminished signal, to a diminished signal. So the cell re recognizes that it's not getting enough signal. It's not getting a message, just one type of message. So it wants to increase the amount of that message it's getting. It puts more receptors on the cell. Now, in type 2 diabetes, we can have down regulation. We can have down regulation. So in type 2 diabetes, it's typical in people who, are, who don't have the best diets, who eat tons and tons of sugar and chronically have high levels of insulin. Well, their bodies decrease the amount of receptors, they decrease the sensitivity, they desensitize their bodies to insulin. Upregulation. So, you know how, so when you talk to some people, you know, they'll say, don't drink alcohol, but they'll say they drink alcohol and they, they get energy, they talk more, they're, they're more talkative when they drink alcohol. And, you know, you might have heard that alcohol is a depressant. And people think, oh, well, I'm happy when I have a glass of wine. How is alcohol a depressant? Well, alcohol is a depressant because it blocks signal pathways. It prevents signals from being passed in our central nervous system. It blocks signals from being passed in our central nervous system. When people are heavy alcoholics, when people drink all day, every day, heavy, serious alcoholics, they, their body starts to adapt to the presence of alcohol in their bodies all the time. And their body says, we need more of these signal pathways. We need more signal in this pathway that's being blocked by alcohol. So I'm going to make more receptors for those signal pathways. So they're more sensitive. They don't. They can get. They can get more of the signal despite the alcohol preventing the signal from being passed. Then, that alcoholic decides to go cold turkey and stop drinking alcohol. 
100% cold turkey. So those inhibitory alcohol molecules go away. But the brain still has all these extra receptors in the brain. So there's no more inhibition, but a huge number of extra receptors. What's going to happen? Well, this is part of the reason why people can die. Alcoholics can die if they don't get alcohol. This is why if you're an alcoholic, you need to go to the doctor, you need to go to the hospital when you decide to get off alcohol. The normal signal, as the signal levels normalize in the person's brain, those, that normal level of signal has a higher number, it has an upregulated number of receptors which leads to an increased stimulation of this cell, which can lead to seizures and death. Upregulation. Agonists mimic signal, they activate. Antagonists block signal, they inhibit. Downregulation, decrease receptors, decrease response. Upregulation, increase receptors, increase response. Signaling processes have built-in termination mechanisms. So when you send a signal, you want to be able to turn it off at some point, right? You only want that signal, you only want that stimulation to act for a certain amount of time. So here's a few ways that your body does it. Sometimes that signal molecule just floats away. It just diffuses away. Signal molecule just diffuses away. Sometimes it's pumped away. It's actively pumped away. You use ATP to move it away, sequester it away. Sometimes you degrade the signal. So right here we have blue Pac-Man. Blue Pac-Man's about to eat yellow diamond. And it's gonna break yellow diamond down into something else. So enzymes, this is really common, enzymes will degrade the signal. You can remove the signal, so just remove it away. And you can also remove the receptor. So after the ligand is bound to the receptor, just remove the receptor. Different ways of terminating the message. And it's really important to understand these also. Um, communication issues between cells cause a lot of the healthcare issues that we have in our society. And so you will have patients that have issues with intercellular communication intracellular communication, cells, cells communicating with other cellular cells. You're gonna have patients that have those issues and it's important to understand what's going on. Many diseases are caused by issues being able to terminate signals also. And also many medications work in this realm also. Work in this realm also. And so with that, I'm going to complete this part one video. I will see you in part two.